My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in New York. Today, I wanted to do a video on how to read your own heart monitor. Now, the first thing I wanted to say is I wanted to wish you all a really happy new year. Secondly, I wanted to thank you all for uh, all the support you've given me in the past year. We have now reached 200,000 subscribers and both Bluebell and uh, me are exceptionally grateful for all the support you've shown at me. I don't think we could have ever gotten to this level or we could be as happy as we are without you. So thank you so much. Now, let's get on to the main thing, which is how to read your own heart monitor. I'm going to just show you what I do and how I look at a heart monitor and how I read it. And I think it's important now because a lot of people at this point in time with all that is going on around us are experiencing symptoms of palpitations. Some of them are you know, due to heart rhythm disturbances, but some can just be due to anxiety and stress. And the way you try and work out the difference is to have a heart monitor. The problem is heart monitors are difficult to come by. They require you to come to hospital, You know, particularly the 24 hour halter monitors. You have to come to hospital, you have to get strapped to a monitor, you have to wear it, you have to hope that you get your symptoms in that period. And then you have to come back to the hospital and someone has to take the monitor off you and download the information. And that can take a lot of time, particularly downloading the information, getting the information analyzed, sending it to a consultant who then has to look at it and then write to the patient, et cetera. And a lot of people are now trying to source their own heart monitors. And indeed, there are some exceptionally good innovative monitors available, which can just be sent to you in the post, which you can apply yourself. And then you can send back and the information gets downloaded. And that information, you know, you can get the results within uh, a week or two weeks at most. The problem with this kind of thing is that these reports come back and they often go to the patient and they're filled with jargon and the poor patient doesn't understand what these things mean, but can get very anxious and stressed about all the horrible sounding, daunting names and terms. And I thought I would just go through some of the things that I look at when I get one of these results and hopefully it may help someone. So let's get started. I'm going to try and do this on Zoom. So I'm gonna share my screen. And then what I'm gonna do is, here we go. Um, let's open this up and let's just open this right up. Okay, so here is um, a typical anonymized heart monitor report, okay? This is with a company called Icentia. I use them, but there are others which um, produce these patches which work as heart monitors. So they will send the patch out to you, you put it on. Uh, the patch aims to record every single heartbeat for the duration it's on the patient. And then at the end of that time, whatever you, know, you have paid for, so you can pay for 24 hours, 48 hours, one week, two weeks. At the end of that time, you take the patch off, put it in the box that it came in and send it back. And someone then looks at all that information and produces a report like this. And this is a typical report and these are the ones I use. So what does a monitor like this and what does a report like this tell us? So I think the first thing to understand is that what are we looking for on a heart monitor? Well, we're looking for two things. We're looking to see what is happening to the heart rhythm when the patient complains of symptoms. So the most important thing with a heart monitor is to try and capture symptoms. If you don't have your symptoms when you, during the course of the time you have the heart monitor on, then in some ways you're none the wiser. But, and that's why having a long monitor is a better thing because you're more likely to suffer symptoms during a longer period of monitoring. So the first thing we want to look for is what happens to the heart rhythm when the patient is experiencing symptoms. And to try and capture that, these patches come with a little button. So you develop your symptom, the patch is recording every single heartbeat, but when you get your symptom, you press the button and the patch, the, the computer in the patch will put a little mark on that. And so when all this information gets downloaded, of course, you're looking at everything, but you're trying to focus on the points where the person has pressed the button. So that's the first thing you want to look at. And the second thing you want to look at is if there are any other incidental findings, so patients can get silent heart rhythm disturbances, 
things that they don't know about, but you may see on a monitor. So you're looking for symptomatic episodes and you're also looking for incidental episodes. I think it's also important to understand what do I mean by an episode? Well, the patch is really looking for heart rhythm disturbances. So there are two types of heart rhythm disturbances, broadly speaking. There are non-sustained heart rhythm disturbances. By that, I mean that the heart rhythm disturbance happens for a few seconds and then spontaneously stops. And then there are sustained heart rhythm disturbances. And by that, I mean that you get an episode which goes on for a much longer period. What is the time cutoff between sustained and non-sustained? Generally, it's believed that 30 seconds. So if something goes on for less than 30 seconds, it's generally regarded as non-sustained. And if something goes on for more than 30 seconds, it's regarded as sustained. In general, non-sustained heart rhythm disturbances are not dangerous because they're non-sustained, they come to an end. But something that goes on for more than 30 seconds and ideally several minutes is more interesting because remember the issue with a heart rhythm disturbance is that when you have that heart rhythm disturbance, when you're in the midst of that heart rhythm disturbance, the heart is not going to be as efficient as a pump. So it is sustained inefficiency that is important, not non-sustained efficiency. If I get a missed beat or an extra beat, my heart has been inefficient for a second or two seconds. It doesn't re it's not gonna really do me any harm. If on the other hand, I have a rhythm disturbance which goes on for two hours, that means my heart is inefficient for two hours. That potentially could result in less blood going around for two hours. Um, and that could be more interesting or potentially harmful in the right subgroup of patients or in the wrong subgroup of patients. So uh, we're looking for uh, symptomatic episodes, we're looking for incidental findings, we're looking for sustained episodes, and we're looking for non-sustained episodes. As I say, non-sustained episodes are not dangerous and often lots of people get non-sustained things going on with their heart rhythm which don't need anything at all. Uh, sustained rhythm disturbances are more interesting. So you get a report like this. And so the first thing I would look at is you, you look at the, obviously you want to identify the patient. Um, the second thing is you look at the total duration. So this particular patient uh, wore their monitor for seven days, three hours and six minutes. And during this period of time, we captured 578,924 heartbeats. On average, we have 100,000 heartbeats a day. So on this occasion, we captured 578,924 beats. That's how many beats were captured on the monitor. So we can get a, we have a really good assessment of what's going on with the patient's heart because we're capturing every single heartbeat. During this time, what we can see is that the maximum heart rate goes up to 144 beats per minute. The minimum heart rate goes to 44 beats per minute, and the average heart rate is about 59 beats per minute. Maximum heart rate, what is the maximum heart rate? Well, generally it's 220 minus your age. So thereabouts, you know, so if I found someone who was uh, 80 and I saw their heart rate was 200, that would be abnormal to my mind. What is minimum heart rate? Generally anything above uh, 40 beats per minute is fine, but in young, healthy people, the heart rate can go even lower it is not too worrying provided you know there is a situation explaining it so in this case if the heart rate was going at 180 uh, the important thing for me to try and work out was was the patient exercising or doing something that could make their heart rate go up in which case it's completely explainable and nothing else to worry about average heart rate 60 59 60 is very very reasonable um, now, what does the maximum RR mean? Uh, the RR is essentially the longest period of time or the, the time interval between two heartbeats. And so generally the RR should be less than three seconds. And so this man has, oh, this person has a, an RR of 1.86 seconds. And I'll show you what the RR looks like on, on the monitor. Uh, so that's, that, that's all the basic data which tells me that you know, his heart doesn't go too fast, his heart doesn't go too slow, and the gap between the heartbeats is not more than three seconds, and that's all reassuring so far. 
I think it's also worth knowing that generally having a high heart rate when you need it and low heart rate when you don't need the heart to work hard is a sign of good health. It's, it demonstrates good heart rate variability. It tells you that your pacemaker that God gave you when you were born is um, a healthy pacemaker because it's responsive. You know, it doesn't need to work hard. It goes down when, it, when you want it to work harder, like during exercise, it speeds up. So good heart rate variability is a sign of good health. Now, the next question is, let's talk about sustained heart rhythm disturbances. So in terms of sustained heart rhythm disturbances, as I say, we're looking for things like atrial fibrillation, supraventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, but they generally go on for more than 30 continuous seconds. And in this particular patient, you can see when you look here, it talks about atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and they say that, look, you know, we found 52 minutes worth of atrial fibrillation atrial flutter, and I'll show you what that looks like. So those are the sustained rhythm disturbances. And then you come to this column where you see these things called SVEs and ventricular ectopics. This refers to non-sustained heart rhythm disturbances. So these refer to extra beats or things that people will feel like missed beats. In general, they do not continuously go on for more than 30 seconds. In general, um, they are completely benign and seen in normal healthy volunteers as well. In fact, there was a study done where they took healthy volunteers and they did a monitor on these people who had no problem in the world and 60 out of 100 in a 24 hour period had um, ventricular and supraventricular ectopics. So in this case, you can see this man has um, 29 ventricular ectopics over a one week period and 2,928 supraventricular ectopics over this period. And this wouldn't worry me in the slightest. On average, people get about 100 ectopics a day. So having something like this wouldn't worry me over a seven day period at all. Now, let's go through this and have a look. Okay, so then you get a chart like this. And what this is basically telling you is that the, what the heart rate trend is. So you can see here, that the heart rate is going at around about you know, 60 beats per minute. And this seems to correlate with uh, when the patient is asleep, you see midnight, and then the patient will wake up and then you see the heart rate go up and because the patient is doing things, is active, et cetera. And at night, he sort of retires to bed around about sort of, I don't know, um, seven, eight, nine o'clock or something like that. And then the heart rate is lovely and settled and then the heart rate goes up. And that's a typical trend that you see in normal people. So the next question then is, okay, then you're faced with these horrendous looking graphs and we, you know, that can be quite, um, quite scary. So I'm gonna just show you what a normal graph looks like, a normal ECG looks like. Whenever you look at this, the most important thing is to understand these spikes or to look at these spikes, okay? These are called the QRS complexes. A normal ECG complex has a little P wave here, which is when your top chamber, the atria contracts, that's a P wave. This is the QRS, which is the electricity going into the ventricle. And then the ventricle will contract mechanically from here to the end of here to the end of this T wave. And from there, it will relax, fill with blood. And as it's filling towards the end, the atria will pump a little bit in here. This is the P wave again, the atria contract, the QRS happens, the heart contracts here up to the end of the T wave. And then the heart starts relaxing, the atria contract, P wave, push blood into the ventricle. And then the ventricle, the electricity goes down the ventricle and the ventricle contracts, etc. When you're looking at one of these, the most important thing is to look at the distance between the spikes, okay? That is the most useful bit of information. The distance between the spikes tells you two things. It tells you about the regularity or irregularity of the heart. So if you look, the distance should be equidistant, okay? So this distance is the same as this distance, is the same as this distance. So when you see that you lose this regular pattern, then you have to ask yourself why. And the other thing, of course, is that the distance between the spikes gives you an idea of the heart rate. So the way I work out the heart rate is I would calculate the number of squares uh, uh, between two spikes. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And I would divide 300 by this number. And I would get a value of about 50, you know, so 44, something like that. So 300 divided by the number of squares 
tells you what the heart rate is. Here, you see 300 divided by two squares over here shows, gives you a heart rate of 150, you know, so 144, 150. So, what I'm trying to say is that the only real thing that you need to look at is the distance between the spikes, because that tells you how fast the heart rate is going, and whether the, the distance between the spikes is equidistant between successive complexes, which will tell you about the regularity. So here, you can see the heart is perfectly regular, and you can calculate the heart rate, and that is about 50 beats per minute. Okay, so that's all fine. Here it sort of slightly changes, but then it goes into this pattern and it's still regular. So none of that would cause me any concern. Here, the heart is going much faster because the complexes are closer together. So the heart rate is going at about 150, but they're still very regular. And that tells me that the heart is going fast, but it's going regularly. And if I saw this, I would want to know what the patient is doing. What I do know is that the impulses are coming from exactly where they should be, because I can see that the atria are contracting. You see that here's the P wave, and 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 here's the P wave. So this is called sinus tachycardia. Sinus, because you see this P wave, it's coming from this where God intended it to. So your pacemaker is firing, your atria contracting, and this is called a sinus rhythm. So this is sinus tachycardia. This is sinus bradycardia because the heart rate is less than um, 60 beats per minute. You know, it's 44. Okay, so that's what a normal impulse looks like. Now, let me show you some other interesting things. Look at this. Look at what happens here. Your heart is lovely and regular. You've got this P wave and then it comes in and you've got this P wave, but look at what's happening here. Here, the heart is completely irregular. You see, this distance is not the same as this, is not the same as this, is not the same as this, is not the same as this. This rhythm, when you look at it, and if it goes on for 30 continuous seconds or more, is called atrial fibrillation. So I will show you some more examples of atrial fibrillation. There is no other rhythm which will look like this. All other rhythms will have some kind of regular pattern, okay, it may be regularly irregular. The only rhythm you will see which is irregularly irregular is atrial fibrillation. So whenever you are looking to see whether you have atrial fibrillation, a lot of people have their cardia um, devices and they look and they say, oh my god, the cardio said I might have AF, what does it mean? All you do is you look at these spikes, okay, and you say, is the distance between the spikes equidistant? If it is, it cannot be atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is always irregularly irregular. It's chaotic. This, on the other hand, here is this is a person who goes into atrial fibrillation and see how quickly he pops out and it changes completely. The rhythm changes. And actually, another thing you see is how when they come out of atrial fibrillation, the heart slows down so much. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You know, so the heart rate over here, 300 divided by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine and a bit. So it's almost around about sort of 30 to 40. So the heart slows down. The patient may feel dizzy at this time, and then suddenly the heart goes back into a normal rhythm. So that's what happens. And a lot of people who go into atrial fibrillation will say, I felt like passing out when I come out of the atrial fibrillation. And that's what happens. The heart slows down um, when that happens. So that's, that's what atrial fibrillation looks like. And again, you can see this more atrial fibrillation here. Uh, all irregularly irregular. Now, some people say, well, what does atrial flutter mean? In atrial flutter, you can see a little bit more of the atrial activity. So the atria are not just not working. Over here, you see, you won't see any P waves, really. And therefore, these are called, this is atrial fibrillation. Here, people say, oh, well, maybe these are, um, these are uh, the P wave, the atria are not doing very much, they're fluttering and you see this. To my mind, this is still atrial fibrillation because it is irregularly irregular. Everywhere I see the spikes are not equidistant. So to my mind, this is atrial fibrillation and it should be treated as such. Uh, what else can I show you? Okay, here, this is interesting. Let me show you this. The, so what we have picked up here is that this patient uh, has sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia, and he gets episodes of atrial fibrillation. Um, now, look at this. These are some examples of non-sustained rhythm disturbances. So you see the spike and the spike and the spike, and it's all equidistant, and it's all equidistant, and it's all equidistant, and then something comes in here. And this is a premature beat. It's premature because it's come in 
earlier than what you would expect with these beats. And this is an ectopic beat. It's a P uh, SVC, a premature beat. So it's premature. It's a supraventricular ectopic beat because it looks a little bit like all the others. So it's coming from the same direction. All your impulses come from the top down. And because this looks similar to that, you can see that this is a supraventricular ectopic beat, a single supraventricular ectopic beat. How will this manifest? How will you feel it? If you felt it, most people may not even feel it, but if you felt it, you will feel uh, a missed beat. And I'll try and explain that to you here. Okay, so here you see, look, here is the heart, has, it's contracting and the heart contracts and pumps out blood. And then at the end of this, the heart starts relaxing. Now the heart is gonna relax for this duration of time. Okay, from here all the way up to here and then it'll contract again, which means so you've got about three squares worth of filling of blood before it contracts again. Now here, the heart is just contracted and it doesn't really get much time to fill with blood because this beat has come in. And therefore, the heart will beat, but not much blood will get pumped out. And this will therefore feel like a missed beat to the patient, but it is actually an extra beat. But the patient will mechanically feel it like a missed beat because although you have this electricity, the heart hasn't filled with much blood to pump that blood out. And then the next beat that comes in, as you can see, takes much longer. So here is where the heart will start filling with blood and it fills 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 and then it pumps out. And then you get a much heavier beat because the heart has filled up with so much more blood in that um, gap after this ectopic that you get a big thud and then it all normalizes. So that is the mechanism behind supraventricular ectopics. Here you can see very interestingly, you get two in a row, right? So uh, you get normal and then suddenly something comes in a little bit early. It looks like these ones. So it's an ectopic which has come from around about here. So it's a supraventricular ectopic and you get another one as well. And then uh, it all goes back. So this could feel like a bit of a flutter for people. Here you get a few more, you see. So here, you, what happens is, look, you get normal, 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 and then suddenly something comes in a bit early, something comes in a bit early, and this goes on, and this goes for about 26 seconds. Uh, actually, this is probably uh, the beginnings of atrial fibrillation because it sort of speeds up, so you're getting some supraventricular ectopics, and then it starts going irregular, and you can see that it changes to irregular beats, so this distance is not the same, et cetera. So you, you're getting some supraventricular ectopics, the atrio is starting to begin to get irritable, and then you get, go into this atrial fibrillation. Um, and, but you see, because it hasn't gone on for more than 30 seconds, people don't call it atrial fibrillation, they'll call it a run of supraventricular ectopics. So we don't call it a sustained heart rhythm disturbance because it hasn't gone on for more than 30 seconds. So that's why they've called it supraventricular ectopy or a run of supraventricular ectopics. But it is actually the beginnings of atrial fibrillation. This patient didn't quite go into full-blown atrial fibrillation and came out of it by themselves. Here is something called supraventricular bigeminy. So what happens here is, look, you get a supraventricular ectopic, then you get a compensatory pause, then you get a normal beat, then you get a supraventricular ectopic, then you get a compensatory pause, you get a normal beat, then you get a supraventricular ectopic. This is generally quite uncomfortable for patients because the heart really thuds. You see, you get the heart is halved here, the heart rate, okay, because he, the patient's going to feel this beat and then he's going to feel a thud here because, he, because of all this filling. And then again, you get another one and he gets a big thud and then you get a big thud. And people just generally don't like supraventricular ectopics. Here, you're getting ventricular ectopics. So again, these are non-sustained. You know, you're only getting one beat. You're not getting lots in a row. But you can see normal beat, normal beat. And then you get something which just comes in a little bit early and looks completely different. Uh, it's probably better off here. And this is a ventricular ectopic. How do I know it's a ventricular ectopic? Well, it comes in a bit early and it looks completely different. It looks broader. It's a different direction. It looks completely bizarre. So all this is telling me, it doesn't mean it's dangerous. All it's meaning, telling me is that the ectopics come from the bottom of the heart. And that is why it looks different to a supraventricular ectopic. And you can also get ventricular couplets. And here we go. This is a 
ventricular couplet, one after the other, again, would be felt in the same way. You get normal, 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 missed beat, and then a big thud here. Yeah. And then again, a missed beat and a thud and a normal beat, and then a missed beat and a thud, that kind of thing. So those are ventricular couplets. And when you look at this, you can see in this beat person, they get ventricular couple, uh, ventricular ectopics coming from two separate places because they, they're both these, both these patterns of ventricular couplets because they look so different from the other beats. Uh, but he's getting two, which means that they're coming from two separate places. Uh, one place it looks like this, another place it looks like this. Why is that important? It's important, I guess, because if you had all the ventricular ectopics coming from one place and you had several thousand, then if you want to get it ablated, it'll be much easier because they're all coming from one spot. But if you had lots of different ventricular morphologies, then it means that you have to know where the majority are coming from so that the electrophysiologist can ablate that bit rather than uh, ablating everything because they're coming from everywhere. Here, look, this is a, this person then complained of palpitation here. And as you can see during the palpitation, you can see it is all irregular, all irregular. So this person has gone into atrial fibrillation at, during the palpitation. That's why it's so useful to do this kind of thing. Um, and then again, you know, here um, you see more uh, atrial fibrillation, more atrial fibrillation. Here, I think this person probably goes into the supraventricular or atrial tachycardia first and then you can see he goes a little bit fast, so it, the heart will feel like it's fluttering, and then it goes into fibrillation where it becomes irregular. So here what's probably happening is that the impulses are coming from the top of the heart, the atria is speeding up, and you're getting an atrial tachycardia, and then the patient goes irregular, and the patient is in atrial fibrillation. So that may feel like a flutter. If it doesn't go into atrial fibrillation, the patient will just experience a short-lived flutter and not go into full-blown atrial fibrillation. So on the basis of this, you can see now how we look at these. You know, you can see here, for example, this is all normal, 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 and bang, you know, and now the patient has gone irregular. So his patient's gone into atrial fibrillation. Here you can see normal, 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 and then you get the supraventricular ectopic followed by a compensatory pause. Supraventricular ectopic followed by a compensatory pause. And you can see here a ventricular ectopic. Um, and again, uh, more examples of a supraventricular ectopic. So here, you, so that's why this result, when we go back, and let me just bring that back again, you can see now what this result means. So he says predominantly sinus rhythm, we see the heart generally coming from uh, where God intended to, the impulse is coming from where God intended them to, sinus rhythm, but you get periods of nocturnal bradycardia, the heart rate goes low, 44 at 4.13 in the morning, periods of sinus tachycardia, the heart goes up probably when the patient is exercising. Then he says, they say 15 paroxysms of atrial fibrillation episodes, meaning that there are paroxysms, they come and go. The patient goes into atrial fibrillation, comes out of atrial fibrillation. The longest lasted 24 minutes and 59 seconds. Some went much faster to 144 beats per minute. Um, and then um, you also see that sometimes they, um, get supraventricular ectopics, supraventricular couplets, supraventricular runs, the longest which lasted 49 beats, the one I showed you before the patient went to, to air, and you see ventricular ectopics. Here they said no patient events documented, although the patient did write in the diary that they had some palpitation, they didn't actually press the button, and that's what it means. So I hope you found this useful. Uh, hopefully it'll take some of the mystery away, all the kind of uh, dark magic about reading these things. And um, once again, I hope it's useful. And um, once again, I'm incredibly grateful for everything you do for me. And should you find this useful, I'd love to hear from you. And once again, thank you. All the best. Take care. Bye.